The road to the presidency is littered with campaign car wrecks. I could have been a very good president, but apparently now we'll never know. Candidates make mistakes. All of us are going to make mistakes in a campaign. I mean, nobody's perfect. The minute I saw that video, I thought, this is a problem. Or a scandal erupts. I hate to say it was kind of stupid to do it in the middle of a national campaign. It really was. Come on, move it back, guys! You know, the media really is interested in certain things. They like gaffes and they like sex. Sometimes the candidates bounce back. New Hampshire tonight has made Bill Clinton the comeback kid. But often, the candidate unravels. It's a pretty frightening experience. And I don't think what happened to me would happen again. Every four years, candidates shake hands, flip pancakes, kiss babies, and make colossal mistakes in their quest for the presidency. This is a grueling process. I think it's often a humiliating process. It takes a really special, slightly, you know, maniacally focused individual to, to, to go through that process and to show up every day ready to do battle. Read my lips. It must be a very hard thing to do, running for president. You've got to be some sort of crazy to do it. And so you deserve whatever you get. <laughs> During presidential campaigns, sometimes a trivial mistake can blow up and create doubts about the candidate. And when that happens, the way the candidate handles the incident reveals as much as all their campaign promises. You know, the only thing you can do is run the very best and the strongest campaign you can, because sooner or later in the course of uh, the campaign, you're going to make a mistake or two. Today I announce that I am running for the presidency of the United States of America. Howard Dean, the former governor of Vermont, surprised everyone by becoming the front runner early in the Democratic race. He was the outsider, the anti-war candidate, the internet visionary mobilizing thousands of volunteers. We're going to but Carolina when Dean suffered a devastating loss in the Iowa caucuses, his entire candidacy was reduced to a few moments on television. We're going to South Dakota, and Oregon, and Washington, and Michigan, and then we're going to Washington, D.C. to take back the White House. Yeah! That night, primary night in Iowa, a lot of people were tuning in to see, how is Howard Dean going to respond to this? What does he have to say about why this happened? And instead of talking through that audience into the national audience, which was hanging on his every word, he got caught up in what was happening in the room, a terrible rookie mistake to make in a national campaign. And Arizona, and North Dakota, and New Dean's speech was replayed hundreds of times and downloaded into infinity. He was the butt of thousands of jokes. It looked like TV suicide. Presidential candidates have to look good on TV. They have to project positive images of leadership, and in the primary, it's electability. And Dean just looked like he was too out of the presidential mode. He just did not look presidential. But in the case of the Dean scream, viewers may not have gotten the whole picture. There was a lot of noise. I mean, his supporters were really trying to pump him up as he was trying to pump up his supporters. But on television, it was a directional mic, and so you were hearing only Howard Dean. You weren't hearing the crowd at all. You know, it sounds like he's way above the crowd and has lost control and is shouting and screaming. I don't care about the directional mic. I don't care about the screaming kids that needed reinforcement or enthusiasm or bucking up. It was an important political moment. And I was sitting at the anchor desk the night of the Iowa caucuses, and my jaw dropped, and I mean quite literally, my jaw dropped. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. But Dean's campaign was already badly wounded by his own mistakes and by the increasingly critical media coverage. You sit down. You've, you've had your say, and now I'm gonna have my say. His shoot from the hip temperament, his anger, even his wife, everything was fair game. 
We need your help. His policies became secondary. We need your help. The press was really hammering pretty hard at Howard Dean. And, uh, the, you know, the scream, it really became a metaphor, I think, for the, for the Dean campaign about how much it had slipped, how it had lost its luster, and the sudden desperation that surrounded the, the Dean camp. Howard Dean never regained his momentum. Four weeks after the scream, he withdrew from the race. I am no longer actively pursuing the presidency. Dean's campaign brought new ideas and energy to the Democratic race. But his infamous speech will symbolize his failed candidacy forever. Poor Howard Dean. I mean, is it really fair to say that's the thing that defined the Dean campaign, and yet um, for the rest of Howard Dean's life, whatever happens to him, politically or otherwise, he'll be hearing about and watching <laughs> His speech on Monday night from Iowa. I mean, it's just, it's unfortunate. While running for president in 1988, Michael Dukakis learned all too well how missteps can unravel a campaign. How are you? Good to see you. Thank you. The Massachusetts governor made a classic gaffe while touring a defense plant. I was arguing strongly that the administration was spending too much money on high tech weapons and not enough on conventional weapons and happened to go to this particular factory in Michigan, which was making tanks. The campaign stop was engineered to combat Dukakis's wimp on defense liberal stereotype. It's going to be a strong national defense that doesn't shortchange our conventional forces. But the candidate's efforts to prove his military prowess went a little too far. One of the things you want to do at an event like that is create a good visual, so let's have him take a ride in a tank, which may or may not have been a mistake, but then no one has ever claimed credit for it, understandably, and there are a lot of theories about whose idea it was, but anyway, he put the helmet on, uh, and he looked ridiculous. <laughs> that did it. I mean, he looked like Snoopy. In one of the worst campaign photo ops of all time, Michael Dukakis acted like he was General George Patton. And even the camera crew shooting him found it hilarious. Oh, come on, put him up. You know, making people laugh at you is not good when you're the presidential candidate, and people did laugh at you. Boy, the minute I saw that video, I thought, this is a problem. And you could immediately start writing this text for the Republican ad, which of course eventually did appear. Michael Dukakis has opposed virtually every defense system we developed. He opposed new aircraft carriers. He opposed anti-satellite weapons. And now he wants to be our commander in chief. America can't afford that risk. Well, hey, it's politics. I mean, you can't blame him for doing that. Vice President George Bush. The but his problems didn't end there. Even more damaging was his response to Bernard Shaw's opening question in the second presidential debate. Governor, if Kitty Dukakis were raped and murdered, would you favor an irrevocable death penalty for the killer? No, I don't, Bernard, and I think you know that I've opposed the death penalty during all of my life. Now, if you're an opponent of the death penalty, that's a question that you were asked a thousand times. Unfortunately, I answered it as if it had been the thousandth time that I had answered it. And obviously, you know, that just was not what I should have done. If it were my husband, he'd probably say, I'd go and kill the guy myself. You know, I mean, that's, I mean, you just, and if, you know, if it's your wife, your daughter, I mean, the emotions have to be crazy. But you add, as President of the United States, I still do not support the death penalty. But you would at least say something to show your emotion. So he may try to create opportunities after that for him to show a little anger and to defend his wife and to show some passion. Dukakis tried to undo his debate mistake during a later interview with Bernard Shaw. Kitty is probably the most, is the most precious thing she and my family that I uh, have in this world. And, uh, you know, the public, obviously. they didn't like that about him. They didn't like that cool, sort of detached, um, overly analytical. You know, they want a little blood in their president, flesh and blood. Just a few minutes ago, 
I called Vice President Bush and congratulated him on his victory. And I, wanna... you know, I didn't lose that election because of that question. Had I run a much better, a much stronger campaign, uh, that by itself would not have defeated me. These kind of gaffes become really dangerous when they play into something that people already believe about you. Howard Dean in the scream played into the idea that this guy was a little bit too quick on the draw. He didn't think before he spoke. Dukakis in the tank played into the idea that this was really a small guy. He's the governor of a medium-sized, very liberal state. He looks completely out of place in this tank. He is not the man we want to be our commander-in-chief. The event itself is, is not what turns the campaign around. It's all of a sudden, all of the uncertainties that people have, all of the nervousness that they have is symbolized in a particular moment. Now, uh, David, yes. will you hit the one minute switch, please? Since the advent of television, campaign gaffes are now seen by millions of people. Okay. You hear me now, speaking? Is that about the right uh, tone of voice? It all began back in 1960 with the first televised presidential debate. The candidates need no introduction. The Republican candidate, Vice President Richard M. Nixon, and the Democratic candidate, Senator John F. Kennedy. The first question to Senator Kennedy from... Mr. With his Clinton. command of foreign and domestic policy, Vice President Nixon was expected to win the debate. Television changed his odds. People who heard them debating on the radio said Nixon won. People who saw them debating on TV said John Kennedy won. That had a lot to do with how they looked on TV. And some people said it was as simple as the fact that Nixon had a five o'clock shadow and looked a little bit, a little bit ominous. Nixon appeared pasty and sweated under the television lights, while Kennedy was tan, rested, and in control. Visually, there was no contest. The debate suggested that on television, style could trump substance. I think that that whole notion that, that the Nixon-Kennedy debates proved the superficiality of television, it's wrong, in my view. The television enhanced that experience a great deal. If you, did, if you didn't see that debate, you missed half the debate. And it wasn't just because Nixon wasn't wearing makeup. This was a guy who looked, well, shifty. Uh, and, you know, subsequent history suggests that judgment might have been right on. Looking right at the camera here. Nixon lost both contests, the debate and the election. For the next 16 years, no other presidential candidate would dare to debate on television. Television changed the campaign equation, magnifying and repeating missteps that might otherwise have gone unnoticed. Mr. President, Marilyn Monroe. Sex and politics make uneasy bedfellows. Whether it's Jimmy Carter admitting to Playboy magazine that he had lust in his heart. Governor, are you dismayed by the reaction to your Playboy interview? Or a sex scandal recorded on tape. The truth is, I loved him. Sex is hell for the candidate. For most of the 20th century, the press respected the private lives of politicians. Reporters knew about the alleged mistresses of Franklin Roosevelt, General Dwight Eisenhower, and John F. Kennedy, but never wrote about them. The unwritten rule was that essentially sexual behavior it was simply off limits. Uh, um, if reporters knew about it, they didn't report it. But that was not the way it worked for Gary Hart. The two-term senator from Colorado was the leading candidate for the 1988 Democratic ticket. For years, there had been rumors about his infidelities. Hart told reporters that the womanizing stories were untrue and said in an interview that he could handle close scrutiny. His big problem was when he told the New York Times magazine, you know, I lived this dull life, you don't think so, follow me around. The facts are, and I think that reporter would say, I invited him to join me in all my public rounds as a means of dispelling that rumor that was being circulated by both the White House and other campaigns. It, uh, I was not stupid enough to challenge or dare the entire media. Uh, that would be an act of folly. 
But even before the New York Times article was published, Hart was under surveillance. A team of five Miami Herald reporters did a 24-hour stakeout of Hart's Capitol Hill townhouse and reported that a young woman had spent the night with Hart. The Donna Rice sex scandal was launched. Well, I hate to say it, it was kind of stupid to do it in the middle of a national campaign. It really was. Um, I mean, he could have waited until after he was elected. Gary Hart's big problem was that his idol was John Kennedy, and Gary didn't understand that rich people have long driveways. You can't see into Kennedy's houses or Nelson Rockefeller's, but if you've got a house on Capitol Hill, the Miami Herald can sit on the stoop. Donna Rice was the 29-year-old model described in the story. I'm very tired. I'm operating on about two hours of sleep. I've just met... Newspapers reported that she had dated Hart for several months, even vacationed with him on a boat in the Bahamas. But Rice denied they were having an affair. If you haven't been extremely careful before you run, you got to be extremely careful when you're on a national campaign because people are going to be there looking for you to misstep and they're going to be ready to write that story and get the headline and win whatever kind of prize there is out there to win. The news calls. Hart, campaigning in New Hampshire, tried to face down reporters. Do you believe that adultery is in law? Yes. Have you ever committed adultery? Um, I, I do not have to answer that question. It was the first time in a presidential campaign that such an intimate question had been asked at a press conference. We didn't even decide. Now the candidates' sex lives were fair game, and Gary Hart was surrounded. Look, folks, there is something called fairness in society. There's something called fairness. You can ask me about adultery, you can ask me any question you want, and believe me, my wife and I have answered more personal questions than I... The phrase that journalists use themselves is feeding frenzy. The media are, in some ways, like sharks swimming in the water, and if there's blood, they're going to go for the target. We have time for two more questions. No. Two more no. questions. No. It's a pretty frightening experience, and having gone through it myself, I, it's not pleasant. After fighting the accusations for a few days, Hart found out that the Washington Post planned to publish a story about another alleged extramarital affair. It was time to quit. Now, clearly, under present circumstances, this campaign cannot go on. We're all going to have to seriously question a system for selecting our national leaders that reduces the press of this nation to hunters and presidential candidates to being hunted. Hart's campaign unraveled in six hellish days. His high-risk behavior and the press and public appetite for scandal changed the rules of political coverage. Hart never admitted to the affair. But three weeks after he quit the race, evidence of his relationship with Rice appeared in the National Enquirer. Talk about the emblematic moment. You have a photograph of him with Donna Rice on his lap on a ship called the Monkey Business. This is not necessarily disqualifying, but it doesn't speak well for the seriousness of, of the person who was caught in that situation. For journalists, reporting on Gary Hart's sex life was justified because it revealed his character. To say the public needed to find out about his character. I, I read that by big people who had known me for 15 years, and it just stuck in my throat because they knew there was nothing wrong with my character. I think it was a media self-justification for placing a candidate for president under surveillance. And I don't think what happened to me would happen again. Do you have any comments about the allegations from Jennifer Flowers? But just four years later, during the 1992 primary season, it was sex and character all over again. But this candidate handled it differently. Let's give him a little room. Bill Clinton was campaigning in New Hampshire when the story broke. Clinton, like Hart, had been accused of infidelities before, but this time it blared over the cover of a supermarket tabloid. 
His accuser, Jennifer Flowers, was paid $150,000 for her story and had tapes of their phone conversations. Yeah, what's going on with her relationship with Jennifer Flowers? There really isn't one, obviously. <laughs> I mean, the charges are false. As the scandal grew, Clinton's staff tried to discredit Flowers. Will you comment on the tapes he has? They also wondered if this was a candidate killing story. It really hadn't been tested. It hadn't been tested in a national campaign before. I mean, the Gary Hart situation, he was driven out of the race so quickly that the public never had a chance to really decide, did this matter? The Clinton team decided to meet the charges head on and brought out a secret weapon, Hillary Clinton. The conclusion of the campaign was, if she's forgiven him or made her peace with him or still stands by him, then whose business is it? Who else does he have to justify himself to? Just four days after the star cover, the Clintons agreed to do a joint interview on 60 Minutes. It was scheduled to run on Super Bowl Sunday, guaranteeing a huge audience. You know, I have acknowledged wrongdoing. I have acknowledged causing pain in my marriage. I have said things to you tonight and to the American people from the beginning that no American politician ever has. And you go. say infidelity doesn't matter as far as your campaign as president, right? That's not what I said. Look at 60 Minutes and see what I said. Some people in the press said, oh, hold on here a minute. I mean, what, what's our coverage become? What, what's presidential politics all about? Is it all about sex now? But the day after the 60 Minutes interview, 500 reporters showed up for Jennifer Flowers' press conference. Yes, I was Bill Clinton's lover for 12 years. And for the past two years, I have lied to the press about our relationship to protect him. At the time, it was like, whoa, there's this woman whose story is half credible at best, uh, and CNN is carrying this press conference live. What started as a tabloid story was now mainstream news. And in the middle of the scandal, a second controversy erupted, this time about Clinton's draft record during the Vietnam War. Look, let me just comment on that. This is an old story. In 1969, Clinton had sent a letter to his ROTC colonel saying that he didn't want to be drafted. That was a wildfire. That was a wildfire, and those two stories together, it was very unclear whether we would survive. You press people, y'all need some workers' comp against each other here. <laughs> His candidacy was in free fall, losing 20 points in the polls. But Bill Clinton had a strategy. We need you. Thank you so much. Clinton understood that he had to make the campaign about the voters. And so he sort of said, they want to make this campaign about my past. I want to make it about your future. And I'm not going to be diverted. I'm going to keep standing up for what I believe in. And I'm going to win this election. Clinton wasn't ready to concede. He just wasn't ready to give up. And he just took on this superhuman kind of energy where he really believed that if he could talk to every voter in New Hampshire, if he could look them all in the eye and talk about his economic plan and how he understood their problems and had some solutions for them, that he could survive. I don't know if there was anybody else in the campaign who believed that, but I think a lot of us believed in him because I've worked for a lot of candidates on a lot of losing campaigns, and you look into their eyes, and there's a moment where you know they've given up or they've just accepted the fact that they're going to lose. I never saw that look in Clinton's eyes, and I kept looking for it because I thought, boy, this is bad. There was something else there. There was this steely resolve that said, I'm not going to quit. Clinton salvaged a second place finish in New Hampshire and made himself look like the winner. I think we know enough to say with some certainty that New Hampshire tonight has made Bill Clinton the comeback kid. Bill Clinton proved that a politician with the right skills could survive a sex scandal, a lesson he would repeat later. Well, I think, I think Clinton did benefit from the hard candidacy. I mean, the, you know, when you put that issue out there, you know, infidelity, sex, it's a shock the first time. It's, it's less of a shock the second time. The American public has kind of figured out where it fits in their thinking. They don't like it. They think candidates ought not to do it. Uh, 
but they don't see it as something that's totally disqualifying. Gary Hart fought for privacy and lost. Bill Clinton gave evasive answers and won. But should the candidate's sex life even be part of the national dialogue? Does sex matter? It depends. You know, does the character of a presidential candidate matter? Yes. But there are many, many elements to character, and I think the public also understands that nobody's perfect and that this is one element of, of people's humanness that sometimes gets the best of them. A presidential nominee's choice for vice president begins with celebration, but it can become a cause for concern. One in five American vice presidents has had to rise to the duties of commander-in-chief. The argument that the vice president is a heartbeat away from becoming commander-in-chief has held more sway since the assassination of President Kennedy. George Bush made his personal choice, J. Danforth Quayle. Hopefully, we will never know how great a lapse of judgment that really was. Mr. Vice President, what about Senator Quayle? The press portrayed Dan Quayle as George Bush's first mistake. Were you trying to avoid service in Vietnam? No, I did not. The media really beat up on him. That made it clear that Quayle was a lightweight. I have as much experience in the Congress as Jack Kennedy did. Lloyd Benson got one presidency. of the great zingers of all time in during a presidential debate. I served with Jack Kennedy. I knew Jack Kennedy. Jack Kennedy was a friend of mine. Senator, you're no Jack Kennedy. There was one comment in a debate that was a 24-hour story. That was really uncalled for, Senator. He would have been better served, and they might have run a better campaign had they worried about trying to define George Bush. Potato. Running for re-election in 1992, Dan Quayle visited a classroom spelling bee. It should have been a simple photo op. But when Quayle wrongly prompted a student, his mistake became a campaign classic. Now, add, add one little bit on the end. Think of potato. How does it... Oh. You're right phonetically, but what else? There you go. All right. Spelling potato with an E became an endless joke at Quayle's expense. A presidential nominee wants his running mate to reinforce his message. Anything else becomes a distraction for the campaign, or worse. In 1972, Democratic presidential candidate George McGovern's last-minute choice of Thomas Eagleton to be his vice president turned disastrous when Eagleton later admitted, On three occasions in my life, I have voluntarily gone into hospitals as a result of nervous exhaustion and fatigue. The Missouri senator hid information that he had received electroshock treatments for depression. Was Senator McGovern aware of these uh, instances of hospitalization before he decided upon you as the candidate? No, he was not. He was made aware of them the weekend or the Monday after uh, the convention. I'm fully satisfied. At first, Democratic presidential nominee George McGovern supported Eagleton. And if I had uh, known every detail, uh, that he would still have been my choice for the vice presidency of the United States. But within a week, he was off the ticket. Put the Eagleton case back on the table. The argument is the public doesn't understand emotional problems that require treatment. Well, uh, if I knew that a potential president of the United States had undergone electroshock treatment, I'd damn well put that out. And the public could figure it out for itself. McGovern's damaged candidacy never recovered from the Eagleton incident. When you're choosing a vice president, you really should have a little more time, but it's hard. And I think that the bar moves a lot in terms of what is relevant. 1984 was the year of the woman in politics, as Walter Mondale knew when he chose Geraldine Ferraro to be his running mate. I never forget her walking up to the podium in that white suit and saying, My name is Geraldine Ferraro. Women were excited all over the country, and it was fascinating to watch men, especially who have these little little girls, daughters, they'd bring them to rallies and put them on their shoulders, or they'd be yelling, I want my daughter to grow up and be present. 
Amid the excitement, trouble brewed. The Mondale campaign hadn't realized that questions would be raised about a woman VP's husband's finances. A husband's activity, this is one of the things about the entrance of, of women into politics and other areas of public life and business that's going to change the rules. The three-term congresswoman always had claimed an exemption from disclosing her spouse's finances. An exemption invoked by fewer than 5% of House members. But now, the press wanted a full accounting. The press was relentless in pushing for us to release our tax returns and to do everything. And accountants and lawyers said, don't do anything until we've had an opportunity to go through, to through them totally. It was a great news story. It was a classic feeding frenzy. That very much hurt the Mondale for our road ticket. Articles linking her husband to alleged mob figures infuriated Ferraro. I just don't think they're going to stoop this low to uh, imply that my husband has any sort of connection with organized crime. I'm absolutely outraged. I think being an Italian American in that race was much more difficult than than my position as the first woman. After 30 days, as much time as the law allowed. Ferraro released her and her husband's tax returns in a do-or-die press conference. I called up my mother ahead of time, and I said, say a prayer, because if this does not go well, I'm going to withdraw from the race. Everybody will get their questions answered. I didn't expect that we would have 200 reporters there. You, aren't you people getting tired? You've explained it went on until people were getting repetitious. So the purpose of the Ethics in Government Act is to prevent conflicts of interest. Do you think you're in violation of the federal requirement that you disclose? I've been sitting here for close to two hours, and I think I have answered that question several times. I do not consider that I was in violation of the, the Ethics Act. And when it was all over, a little bit unprofessional, perhaps, but the press conference, the reporters applauded. Goodbye, folks. That was the only reason I was able to stay in the race. A month after Mondale and Ferraro lost the 1984 election, the House Ethics Committee found that Ferraro had violated the Ethics in Government Act by not reporting her husband's finances. But it recommended no penalty for her errors. In 1985, Ferraro's husband pled guilty to a misdemeanor for overstating figures in a real estate sale. His business dealings would continue to haunt Ferraro and limit her political future. Sometimes the impression will last a lifetime, our lifetime. The spotlight of a national candidacy had changed her life forever. Once you get into a national campaign as a presidential candidate or vice presidential candidate, you know, the the media is there all the time. Uh, there is no sense of privacy. And you, you think you know what it's uh, going to be like, but you don't know until you really experience it. Every candidate has weaknesses. Most try to deal with them before their opponents do. I will not make age an issue of this campaign. I am not going to exploit for political purposes my opponent's youth and inexperience. <laughs> In his campaign for re-election in 1984, Ronald Reagan used humor to bat away the negative issue of whether he was too old to be president again. Until a candidate disposes of a controversy, the press will keep it alive. If you don't hit the face on, if you don't uh, do what has to be done to move yourself and the media, for that matter, on to the next thing, then the press is going to stay on it. Good to see you, sir. How you doing? Oh, all right. Wish you a lot of luck. Thank you. Democratic frontrunner Edmund Muskie was undone because of an emotional moment in the 1972 New Hampshire primary when he replied to an attack. And I've chosen this spot in front of his building. The publisher of the Manchester Union Leader printed a fake letter alleging that Muskie had laughed at Franco-Americans. He also implied that Muskie's wife drank too much and used profanity. By attacking me, by attacking my wife, he has proved himself to be a gutless coward. 
He started to defend his wife. A good woman. This was, this was the famous crying incident. People still question what actually happened, but you know there was a, some water streaming down his cheeks, and uh, how could a person strong enough to be president of the United States be crying? For some reason, these things are bad for politicians to show themselves as human. Muskie won in New Hampshire, but it didn't matter because reporters had played up his moment of weakness. Two things did in Ed Muskie. One is he had this volcanic temper. I mean, he really would go crazy, screaming at people and whatnot. But he had never shown that in public. But reporters traveling with him had seen it, and they thought, this guy is pretty dangerous. And the second thing was, he was such a strong-looking man. He was Lincoln-esque. Big boys aren't supposed to cry. The contrast between his physical appearance and that kind of snuffling crying or whatever it was it made people very uneasy. It was the beginning of the end for Muskie. Mistakes encourage press piling on. Gaffes and weaknesses can provide fuel for an opponent's attack ads. Read my lips. No. Four years after the 1988 Republican convention, George Herbert Walker Bush's words were used against him. Read my lips. Remember, you will be better off four years from now than you are today. Well, it's four years later. How you doing? One reason they go negative is because oftentimes we're more responsive to the negative message. Michael Dukakis called Boston Harbor an open sewer. As governor, he had the opportunity to do something about it, but chose not to. In 1988, Democratic presidential candidate Michael Dukakis faced a barrage of Republican negative ads. You know, and the Bush campaign really did a number on Dukakis. I mean, for many people, uh, it is considered to be kind of the dirtiest of the, of the presidential campaigns of the last 30 or 40 years. Dukakis could have countered the attack ads, but didn't. I made a decision, in retrospect, a very bad decision, that I was going to blow off the Bush attack campaign. You just can't do that. Most damaging was the infamous Willie Horton ad. He allowed first-degree murderers to have weekend passes from prison. One was Willie Horton, who murdered a boy in a robbery, stabbing him 19 times. Weekend prison passes, Dukakis on crime. No Democrat ever, ever again will try to blow off an attack campaign. I mean, the lesson of 88 is that if the other guy's going to come at you, this Bush came at me, you've got to be ready for it, you've got to have a carefully thought out strategy for dealing with it. He said he was never drafted, then he admitted he was drafted. Four years later, President George Bush Sr. attacked Democratic challenger Bill Clinton. But it was a different story, because Clinton had learned the lesson of 88, fight back. What they say about me doesn't amount to a hill of beans. But what they say about the American people really matters. The Clinton people came up with a device in 92. Uh, they called it rapid response. They were always on the alert for some negative piece of information coming down the pipe. I know, I know one thing, if they put out things that are not true and we say nothing, we'll, say, we'll sustain damage a lot faster and a lot more severe and they put out something that's not true and we set the record straight. <laughs> the war room was created to respond immediately to any attack. We had learned through painful experience that charges that go unanswered quickly become part of the conventional wisdom, or that people come to believe them and they become part of the candidate's image, and it's very hard to turn them around once they solidify. I don't think there will ever be a candidate who will come out and run, and at some point they won't find, the opposition won't find, something stupid they said, or venal they did, or mean and exploited. And then it's a question of whether you can handle it, deflect it, explain it, bury it, and it's very hard if you've never had to try before. Now it is my honor to start this race. Gentlemen, start your engines. In 2004, the race for the presidency is well underway. 
at least one candidate has already been unraveled by the process. In this election, will victory or defeat hinge on a gaffe, a scandal, or a defining moment? One image was instantly etched in the campaign memory book. When President George W. Bush landed on the carrier Abraham Lincoln in May 2003, the Top Gun imagery offered a morale booster for the troops and a can't-miss photo op for the president. Major combat operations in Iraq have ended. The United States and our allies have prevailed. Mission accomplished has already become a part of the 2004 campaign, but not in the way the White House intended. George Bush thought he could play dress-up on an aircraft carrier. And he thought he could stand up there in front of a great big sign that said, Mission Accomplished. You don't want a banner that says Mission Accomplished up there. People will misunderstand what that means. As you're going to say, Mr. President, in your speech, the war's not won, just a battle has been won. Uh, you better lower expectations because what's ahead could be very rough. The mission accomplished, I should say, was prevailing militarily. That mission was accomplished. I just hope he gets credit for making a very tough decision as president. But the slogan invited criticism as the fighting continued. Part of their problem was that they had not thought through what happens the day after. And uh, there's no doubt in my mind that if everything had gone according to plan, that we would have seen ads on television right now of President Bush walking off with the helmet in his arm, mission accomplished off of that plane. It would have been a different campaign. You know, I think it's still yet to see whether that was a good idea or a bad idea. It seemed a great idea at the time. Now there are questions. Reminding voters of his National Guard service came at a price. If it is, in fact, a negative, the Bush people have to reinforce the fact that he was indeed a National Guard pilot. That was a uniform he was allowed to wear. Would you like a picture? Will mission accomplished come back to haunt the president? Or will it be seen as a triumphant moment that assures his re-election? It's too soon to tell. Green team. The president has already distanced himself from the slogan. The mission accomplished sign, of course, was put up by the members of the USS Abraham Lincoln saying that their mission was accomplished. I know it was attributed somehow to some ingenious advance man for my staff. Uh, they weren't that ingenious, by the way. Images, mistakes, scandals, the ingredients of the modern campaign seem to promote superficial coverage. But is this the political news the public really wants? If there's a problem with our system and with a concentration on mistakes and so-called gaps, it's the public's problem. We ought to demand that uh, our news system and our media give us more information, but I don't think we want it. That's the problem. I've had serious editors in this country who say people really don't care about ideas or policies. I just think that's outrageous. Being president is about important stuff. It's about our lives. And when journalists say, or editors say, people don't want to read about that stuff, they're just fundamentally wrong. With so much attention focused on missteps and gaffes, is this any way to choose a president? The whole presidential selection process is so far from perfect. But we live in a democracy where the process is necessarily messy. Yeah, in a perfect world, you would have a campaign where all you talked about was ideas. But we've never lived in a, in a society where that was true. Um, it wasn't true 100 years ago, and it's not true now.